Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Joe Chappelle, and you're listening to episode 49 of the OBGYN podcast. I'm sorry for the long delay between episodes, but newborns are tough. And newborns plus toddler, that's a recipe for being unproductive. Well, we are out of the newborn phase here and into the slightly less demanding infant stage, so hopefully we're back on schedule. Today, I have a great new contributor to the podcast. Dr. Heather Link is a third-year MFM fellow with a passion for global women's health, and in particular, maternal mortality. She is starting a new series for us here that delves into the complexities of this topic and how we interpret this data, and then later, how we can use this information in both developed and developing countries. So without further preamble, let's get started with episode 49, Maternal Mortality, Part 1. Thank you, Dr. Chappelle, for giving me the opportunity to participate in this podcast. I'm very happy to be here and to share my passion for global maternal health with your audience. Firstly, I'd like to stipulate that the views I express are my own and are not representative of any organization I currently work for or have previously worked for. Secondly, I think especially at this time, it's important to acknowledge that while much of what will be talked about in this podcast series focusing on maternal mortality is driven by concepts we are familiar with, postpartum hemorrhage, access to essential medicine, undertreated hypertension, There is an undercurrent of policies and politics that are shaping all of this, which we need to become more aware of and more comfortable talking about. As OBGYN providers, I know we are all familiar with how politics can influence the care we provide. However, I would like to make a plug here for expanding our consideration of what exactly health entails, how healthcare is delivered, who is making those decisions, and our role as clinicians in this process. To understand global maternal health, you must understand the following concept. Health is political, and we need to elevate the level of political dialogue when we are talking about health. We need to recognize and be honest about the fact that every time a mother dies in the world, she died because somewhere, someone she never met, never interacted with, and probably never heard of, made a decision that set in place a cascade of events that ended in her death. The gross inequity of global maternal mortality tells us this is true. In the United States, we see this play out in our rising maternal mortality rates, rates that are disproportionately affecting women of color. This is the result of generations of decisions, decisions that resulted in discrimination against these women, decisions that underfunded or withheld health care from low-income Americans, decisions that limited a woman's access to reproductive services, Decisions that prevented families from moving to higher-income neighborhoods with better schools and better jobs. These were all political decisions. We know the inequity of maternal mortality is true when we examine the disparity in global maternal mortality rates across the world. Despite our achievement in lowering maternal death, if we continue along the current course, it will take 160 years for pregnant women in Africa to have the same chance of not dying during pregnancy as women in countries like the UK. We can wait 160 years, or we can do more now. And to do more, we need people in power to make better decisions. They cannot make these decisions without us. They need us to show them how to create policies that support health and support women. We need to show them when policies they have created hurt women. We need to accurately count the women who are dying. We need to help them see the big picture Help them to understand how by not prioritizing women's education, by not funding health care, not providing access to affordable and modern contraception, they are making political decisions that are resulting in deaths. There is nothing more political than the death of a woman who died because someone else made a decision not to fund the interventions that would have saved her life. Health is political. Having said all that, I think a really important place to start this discussion is to break down the concept of maternal mortality. What do people mean when they say this? Where are the numbers coming from? Who is generating these estimates? Why are women dying? How are these trends changing over time? These are all questions I hope to answer for you in our following discussion. So, to start off, let's examine the multitude of ways we have to categorize deaths that occur during or surrounding pregnancy. The World Health Organization defines a maternal death as a death of a woman that occurs during pregnancy or within 42 days of the termination of the pregnancy from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy or its management, but not by incidental or accidental causes. 
A late maternal death is a death related to pregnancy that occurs after 42 days, but less than one year postpartum. Another common term we hear is pregnancy-related death. A pregnancy-related death is defined as a death that occurs during the pregnancy or up to 42 days postpartum, irrespective of cause. Now that's a lot to take in and comprehend, and I think these things are easier to understand if we break them down. A key component of these different definitions is both timing and cause. To be categorized as a maternal death, the cause of death must be known. Maternal deaths are then subdivided into two groups, direct obstetric deaths and indirect obstetric deaths. Direct obstetric deaths are those caused by obstetric complications that result from being pregnant. Think postpartum hemorrhage, liver failure due to acute fatty liver of pregnancy, eclampsia, etc. Indirect obstetric deaths are deaths that are the result of a previous existing disease or disease that developed during pregnancy, which was not due to direct obstetric causes, but was aggravated by the physiological effects of pregnancy. An example of this would be the woman who died of colon cancer while pregnant. As a provider filling out a death certificate, it is important for us to be able to understand enough about these distinctions to fill out the certificate correctly. As a clinician or researcher taking a global view of maternal mortality, it's important not to get too hung up trying to distinguish direct or indirect deaths. The important part is that a woman died, and we need to record this so that we can review the chain of events that led us to this end. We understand that death during pregnancy is nuanced. As a provider caring for high-risk women, I'm skeptical that we can group death during pregnancy into silos where the pre-existing maternal health status is so independent of a pregnancy as to be able to make the assessment that pregnancy was somehow not the quote-unquote cause of her death. However, by accurately recording the information we create the base of evidence used to help research and policymakers understand why women in their area are dying. Importantly, the definition of maternal or pregnancy-related deaths also requires that the death to occur within 42 days of the end of the pregnancy. We must keep in mind that this will miss the deaths of women occurring outside the six-week time period. Some notable exceptions of situations like this will be the peripartum cardiomyopathy patient, whose heart failure ultimately leads to death 16 weeks postpartum, or a preeclamptic patient who initially survives a hemorrhagic stroke but ultimately succumbs to sequelae after the six-week window. Many of you will also have noticed that the key distinction between maternal death versus pregnancy-related death is that to be classified as a maternal death, the death must not occur from accidental or incidental causes. In layman's terms, this means all statistics deriving the definition of maternal death from the WHO definition are excluding deaths that result from motor vehicle injuries, homicide, suicide, or any other cause that could be determined to be accidental. This exclusion of accidental and incidental deaths from official maternal mortality statistics disproportionately affects the perception of maternal of mortality numbers coming from countries that have lower rates of maternal death or lower death from direct obstetric causes. In the UK, from 2013 to 2015, suicide was the third leading cause of death in the first six weeks, and then became the leading cause of death among women who died within the first year after birth. In Australia, from 2008 to 2012, deaths classified as psychosocial were a leading cause of death within the first year after pregnancy. These numbers were tracked and compiled by the UK and Australian government's own assessments of maternal mortality. We can easily imagine how the perception of maternal deaths within these countries would be altered if these leading causes of death were excluded from consideration. The exclusion of accidental and incidental deaths from analysis does not mean that there is no one counting these deaths. Clearly, someone is tracking them, given the information just reviewed. What it does mean is that we need to look carefully at these numbers before interpreting them. Any statistic national or international, or any discussion regarding maternal death that is based upon the WHO definition will exclude from analysis any deaths deemed to be accidental or incidental. 
The most obvious example of this are the global maternal mortality estimates, compiled by the WHO and put out every two to three years. These estimates are based upon the WHO definition of maternal death and, as such, do not consider deaths from incidental or accidental causes. In the United States, the CDC tracks deaths during and related to pregnancy through its Pregnancy, maternal, mor pregnancy Mortality Surveillance System. The CDC defines pregnancy-related death as a death of a woman while pregnant or within one year of the end of pregnancy from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy or management, but not from accidental or incidental causes. In this case, the definition used by the CDC is more inclusive because it includes mortality up to one year. However, it continues to exclude accidental or incidental deaths. So if within the U.S. the CDC is not reporting accidental or incidental deaths and the WHO is not tracking these women, who is? The answer to this lies with our individual states. In our decentralized system here in the United States, states are responsible for tracking the health statistics for their population and then reporting that information to the CDC. Most states have established maternal mortality review committees, which are responsible for tracking and reporting on the maternal deaths. If desired, states can utilize a more robust definition of maternal death in order to encompass deaths due to these accidental or incidental causes. Or they can decide to collect information on such deaths and publish a separate analysis. An example of how this plays out for individual states can be found in the New York State Maternal Mortality Review Report. For the two-year period of 2012 to 2013, which is the most recent available, they reported statistics for both pregnancy-related deaths what we would typically consider to be a maternal death, as well as pregnancy-associated deaths. There were 62 pregnancy-related deaths during this time, but when the broader pregnancy-associated definition is used, which encompasses accidental and inc incidental deaths, there were 104 deaths. In this example, just under 60% of the deaths occurring within the population of pregnant or recently pregnant women are counted using the more traditional and restricted definition of death. Looking more closely at the pregnancy-associated deaths, half of those deaths are due to injury, intentional or unintentional, and the leading cause of injury-related deaths in the state are substance overdose and suicide. The report does not break down these categories further, but using the statistics they provide, I've done the math and the count works out to be 14 overdose deaths and 12 deaths due to suicide. Compare these numbers to the leading causes of pregnancy-related death, which were embolism and hemorrhage. During the same time period, there were 18 embolism deaths and 11 hemorrhage deaths. If you were a layperson reading the summary section of this report, you might walk away thinking the biggest cause of maternal death in your state were embolism and hemorrhage. Perhaps you look closer and see that incidental deaths contribute significantly. But incidental deaths could mean car accidents, or they could mean drug overdoses. And if you don't dig deep and break these numbers down, you can walk away from this not realizing that drug overdose and suicide were the second and third leading cause of death among pregnant women in New York State from 2012 to 2013. If I was a policymaker, that would be an important distinction to understand if I'm trying to allocate funding for maternal health. As advocates for women's health, we need to know these numbers so we can lobby our policymakers to provide the support our patients need. If support services for recovering addicts are being cut in our districts, it's on us to help them see how this relates to maternal death. If homicide is the leading cause of death in your state, what are you doing in your practice to screen women for domestic violence? What are the resources available for these women? How secure is the funding stream for those resources? This is politics. This is health. Another key distinction to point out when we're talking about global maternal health is that we are often talking about the maternal mortality ratio. This is different and often confused with the maternal mortality rate. The maternal mortality ratio represents the number of maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. By using live births as a denominator, this calculates the risk of dying once a woman is pregnant. 
The maternal mortality rate is calculated by dividing the number of maternal deaths by the number of women of reproductive age in a given location during the time period being measured. Knowing the population of an area, as well as the proportion of that population, which consists of women of childbearing age, is very difficult. This makes rate a difficult statistic to calculate, and in general should just be left to the wayside. I think it's common in vernacular to substitute rate for ratio, and should you hear it, it was probably a mistake. If you're a huge stats nerd, you can really get into the weeds on some of this, and there are a plethora of other statistics you can play with. The WHO and World Bank are great sources of data if this interests you. None of these represent perfect statistical parameters for measuring maternal death. As we've already discussed, the definition of maternal death is limited in both time and cause, and by using live births as a denominator, it is obvious to us that we are further limiting ourselves by excluding from analysis any pregnancies that did not result in live births. One of the last things to consider in our discussion of the measurement and classification of maternal death is how difficult it is to actually gather the statistic. Consider that if this is something we struggle with tracking and reporting in the U.S., how difficult must it be for those countries that lack the vital statistics and healthcare infrastructure that is present in high-income countries. If a country has difficulty accurately estimating their general population, it's highly likely that they will also struggle estimating more specific health indices. In areas where it's not possible to obtain case-level data, population-based surveys are often used to generate broad estimates for a given area. These surveys typically involve surveying reproductive age women across a given population to ask them their obstetric history and can be combined with health center records or ongoing population surveillance. This can be very costly and time consuming. Another method of obtaining this information is through the use of sisterhood surveys. These surveys provide an indirect assessment of maternal mortality in a given population by asking respondents about the health of their sisters. It requires a smaller sample size than ongoing population surveillance, and with simple versions, a small number of questions can be added to the survey ongoing within a population to provide an estimate for maternal health. It's limited in its ability to give information about the current status of maternal health in a given region, as it is querying people about prior events. And for this reason, sisterhood surveys cannot be used to evaluate an ongoing intervention or short-term changes in maternal health. Owing to the imprecision inherent to measuring maternal mortality, statistical modeling is now used to help develop the global maternal mortality ratios, as well as many country-specific ratios. The depth of statistical knowledge this involves is beyond the scope of this podcaster to explain, but an important takeaway is that even the best modeling system is limited by the quality of the underlying data. We cannot expect to make accurate estimates if we don't put in accurate assumptions. This is as true in the U.S. as it is in Sub-Saharan Africa. We've talked a bit about maternal mortality in the U.S. and high-income countries. However, the majority of the burden of maternal mortality in the world occurs in low-income countries. 88% of maternal deaths occur in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. And of these regions, two countries, Nigeria and India, account for one-third of all global maternal deaths. Why is it that the lifetime risk of maternal death in sub-Saharan Africa is 1 in 36, but in Europe it's 1 in 2,000? Much of the research looking to address maternal mortality is focused on some aspect of what is known as the three delays. This conceptual model for thinking was proposed in 1994 by Serene Thaddeus and Deborah Main in their paper, Too Far to Walk, Maternal Mortality in Context. In this paper, they performed a broad literature review of maternal mortality and identified three phases of delay, beginning after an obstetric complication occurred, which subsequently influenced the delivery of timely, appropriate, and effective obstetric care. They recognized that the majority of obstetric deaths are preventable and that these deaths are associated with three key delays in care. Number one, the delay in the decision to seek care. Number two, the delay associated with arrival at a health facility, and finally, number three, delay in the provision of adequate care. Alone or in combination, any of these delays can be enough to result in an adverse obstetric outcome and or a maternal death. 
The first delay, the delay in the decision to seek care, is often influenced by socioeconomic, educational, and cultural factors. In most of the world, births are not occurring in medical facilities. 70% of births in Sub-Saharan Africa and South and Southeast Asia occur in the home. The first delay, the delay in the decision to seek care, is multifaceted. It first requires that the need for a higher level, level of care is truly recognized. Cultural norms surrounding birth are very important in this process. In some areas, labors lasting more than a day are considered normal. In situations like this, the recognition of a problem such as obstructed labor is going to be delayed. If the birth has no skilled attendant, the person responsible for determining whether additional care is necessary often becomes the mother-in-law. They are older than the laboring mother, with more experience regarding childbirth given both their established status as a mother as well as prior birth experiences in their own family and community. As the female head of the household, their decision and experience are respected, and in this case, the relationship a daughter-in-law has with her mother-in-law can be the difference between life and death. After identifying that more care is needed, the other critical facet to the decision to seek care is who makes this decision. Care costs money. It is often far away, requiring some means or access to transportation to get there. This opens up a number of questions that must have an answer for care to be obtained. Who makes the decisions within the home? Who makes decisions regarding the finances? Are women able to leave to seek care without a male relative present? Can a woman obtain medical care without her husband present? What if the husband is working far away? How confident are they that the care received at the health center will be adequate? Is there concern that there will be discrimination from health center staff? These circumstances all contribute to the delay to seek medical care. The second delay in our conceptual framework is the delay associated with arriving at a health facility. There's a reason that the title of the 1994 paper is Too Far to Walk. Pregnant women have to travel great distances to receive care. Distance to care is known to influence the uptake of health services and studies in Burkina Faso, Mali, Malawi, Bangladesh, Zambia, and Cambodia have found a linear relationship between the increasing distance to a health center and the decreased proportion of institutional births. A geographic study in Tanzania, using census data and GPS coordinates from households with recent maternal deaths, modeled the distance between women's homes and the obstetric facilities where they sought care. For women who lived less than 5 kilometers from a health facility, there were 111 direct maternal deaths for every 100,000 live births. For women who lived more than 35 kilometers from a health facility, this jumped to 422 deaths for 100,000 live births. In addition to traveling great distances, women have to navigate how exactly they're going to be able to travel those distances. If you live 40 kilometers from a health facility and you don't have access to a vehicle, what seems like a short distance to us can actually take all day. Your mode of transportation to that health facility may include walking, wheelbarrow, bicycle, or being carried in a hammock. If you're lucky enough to be able to afford to hire a vehicle to bring you to the health facility, that does not ensure a swift and easy journey. Only 25% of roads in Sub-Saharan Africa are paved, with less than 40% of people living, in with, living within two kilometers of these roads. The third delay encountered is the delay in receiving the appropriate care after arrival to the health facility. As healthcare providers, we are all aware that not all health facilities are capable of providing the same level of care. When I'm talking about not receiving appropriate care, we are not talking about ending up at a facility with a level 2 NICU instead of a level 3. This is arriving at the health facility and finding that it does not have a trained healthcare provider on duty, or that there is no power at the facility, or that it lacks essential medicines, or that you need to be let into the facility but the guard who works the gate doesn't come in until the morning. In order to assist countries with the provision of emergency obstetric care, the WHO, UNICEF, and UNFPA have created a level of care system for health facilities that identifies the minimum requirements that should be met to safely provide basic emergency obstetric and newborn care or comprehensive emergency obstetric and newborn care. To provide basic emergency obstetric and newborn care, or EMONC for short, 
A facility must be able to carry out seven signal functions. These are the administration of parenteral antibiotics, uterotonics, anticonvulsants, to be able to provide assisted vaginal delivery, removal of retained placenta, removal of retained products of conception, and newborn resuscitation. To be considered a comprehensive EMONC facility, in addition to being able to perform the seven basic EMONC functions, the facility must also be able to perform a cesarean delivery and transfuse blood. It is implicit in the understanding of the provision of emergency care that these signal functions should be available at the health facility 24-7. It is recommended that the minimum availability of these facilities across a population is for at least five emergency obstetric care facilities, including of those five, one comprehensive facility for every 500,000 people. Having maternal health facilities does not guarantee that they are able to meet these emergency obstetric signal functions. A needs assessment of health facilities across parts of Somalia found that among the seven basic EMONC facilities assessed, none of the facilities were able to provide all seven basic EMONC signal functions and that the three district hospitals surveyed, which were the referral centers for comprehensive EMONC care, all had the ability to perform a type and cross, but did not have a blood bank due to state space constraints. The findings that maternal health facilities are ill-equipped for the emergencies they are intended to treat are not unusual. Sometimes, comprehensive EMONC services are not available in the public se sector, creating additional barriers for patients to access this care if they need to pay the costs of a private health facility. Governments have realized that it's not enough to simply have facilities if the quality of care provided cannot address the needs of the population. The success that countries have in addressing these three delays are pivotal to decreasing global maternal mortality. Every day, approximately 830 women die from pregnancy or childbirth-related complications across the world. This equates to one death every two minutes. 99% of these deaths are occurring in low- and middle-income countries. While these numbers are depressing, they represent a significant improvement in maternal survival over the past 30 years. From 1999 to 2015, global maternal mortality has dropped 44%, decreasing from a ratio of 385 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births down to 215 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. While this de decrease did fall short of the Millennium Development Goal number 5, which called for a 75% reduction in maternal death, it helped set the stage for the next set of global indicators, the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs for short. The SDGs are comprised of 17 global goals, which came into effect in 2016 and will guide UN development policy and funding until 2030. SDG 3.1 calls for a reduction in maternal mortality to less than 70 per 100,000 live births, with no individual country exceeding a ratio of 140 per 100,000 live births. Early predictions suggest that these goals will not be met by 2030. However, we are still early in the process. Improvements in care delivery and knowledge are happening every day, and it's too soon to write off SDG 3.1. What is clear is that in order to achieve our goal of ending preventable maternal mortality, more must be done to improve the lives of women and girls around the world and to improve the social and political systems within which they live. A large part of the reason that maternal death gets so much attention is that maternal health is an important indicator of the robustness of an existing health system within a country. Addressing the three delays will not just prevent mothers from dying, it will help all members of the community. When the local health center has increased its capacity to be able to provide blood, it's not just the woman with a postpartum hemorrhage who benefits. It's also the motorbike driver who is hit by a car. We know that pregnancy carries inherent risks and that a certain percentage of deliveries are going to result in complications requiring additional, if not life-saving care. This is a universally understood truth. And if your health system is incapable of providing basic care, to a young, healthy population of pregnant women that you know will require it, how well can that health system serve anyone? As maternal health providers, we can use this knowledge to advocate for our patients. Thank you for your attention today. 
In the next podcast of this series, I'll dive deeper into the causes of maternal death. However, these, how these causes are different among low- and high-income countries, innovations on the horizon to help prevent these deaths, as well as to compare how the U.S. measures up to other high-income countries. Thank you very much.